Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 21st, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, joins us to discuss ways to get the most out of our precious hops. One of those ways is an innovative process bringing a French press coffee maker into the brew house. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing. All one word. And this week uh, we passed the 400 milestone for friends following Basic Brewing on Twitter. I sure hope I can have some fun stuff to contribute to the stream there. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, part of the news that I've been tweeting about is the fact that uh, I harvested another two pounds, seven ounces of Cascade hops out of the garden uh, this past weekend. That brings the total to just over uh, five pounds for the year so far. And there are more hops still on there that aren't ready to pick yet. So more to come. Ought to come up with a lot of recipes for Cascades uh, coming up <laughs> in the next few months. Um Because the rest of the varieties in the garden, well, there's always next year, I guess. Um, And we've had some rain lately, so the little barley crop is looking less parched. Got my fingers crossed there. I also want to tell you about a little experiment I did in reviving ancient yeast. I went to the home brewery in Fayetteville the other day looking for Belgian yeast to do another batch of the Belgian brunette. And they unfortunately didn't have the the strains that I was looking for in stock. Had plenty of other stuff, but my timing was bad last weekend on those those varieties. Anyway, David at the shop found some tubes of uh, White Labs 500 and 550 in a in a fridge in the back, and those tubes had expired in October of 2006. And uh, you might you might ask, well, why did they keep those? Well, let me tell you. Andy said I could have them, so I. I took them home and I added a cup of uh, 1020 gravity starter to each. And uh, I'm now happy to say that those starters look alive and happy. So, uh, you know, don't give up. If you find some yeast, uh, some liquid yeast in the the back of your fridge that uh, looks, you know, like chocolate rather than yeast and is is way expired, don't give up. Mix up up a batch of of, uh, low gravity starter, a small batch, and uh, mix it up and you might have good luck. Hippie Casey, who uh, I know in person and on Twitter, suggested that I call the, the yeasts zombie yeasts. I, mean, I think that's probably <laughs> that's probably a good idea. So the zombie Belgian brunette may be, may be on, the, uh, on the list of things to do. Well, let's take a look into the mailbag before I ramble on any more. Uh, Eric in Atlanta writes, I started brewing about a year ago, and the hobby has been gradually picking up steam. I discovered your podcast about a month ago and absolutely love it. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, as I'm working my way through the archives, I'm constantly coming home excited to tell my girlfriend what I learned that day. One day I came home to find her in a basic brewing T-shirt that she bought for me and nothing else. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, Eric says she's quite supportive. Keep up the good work. Wah! <laughs> now, now, that's a picture for the gallery, the online gallery on basicbrewing.com. <laughs> um, Eric says, uh, P.S., what does it mean when someone says a beer is hot? Well, Eric, when you say a beer is hot, I guess unlike when you describe a girlfriend only wearing a T-shirt, you know, that's pretty hot. Uh, when you describe a beer as hot, you're talking about uh, sort of a hot alcohol taste from um, what they call higher alcohols. It can sometimes be described as uh, tasting like solvent. And those hot alcohol off flavors can come from essentially stressed yeast. When the fermentation temperature is too warm or maybe the aeration levels are, are not enough, um, especially in the first phase of active fermentation, or so I hear those higher alcohols can be produced. And we've heard from brewers of uh, Belgian-style beers, for instance, who keep an eye on the temperature during the initial phase 
of fermentation, maybe the first day or so, and then they turn off the glycol and let the temperatures rise naturally, and then get pretty warm. Um, but after, only after that initial phase is complete, and uh, they're able to get more interesting flavors, those Belgian flavors, uh, coming through without those high alcohol or those hot alcohol flavors. Now, for a barley wine, maybe a little bit of hot alcohol could be appropriate, but you know, for a low to moderate gravity beer, you don't want the alcohol to be hot in those. So uh, pay attention to your temperature and your pitching rate and your uh, your aeration levels, and uh, you won't have hot beer. Uh, you might remember last week David from Montreal was worried about his strong Scottish ale that had been in the bottle for five weeks, and it had little carbonation. Well, Drew from Seattle wrote with some advice. Uh, he says, uh, in regards to David's flat Scottish ale, I had a similar problem with an oatmeal stout about eight months ago. The beer finally carbonated after about three months of being in the bottle. The result was a light carbonation, but with very smooth, textured, tiny bubbles. It's been suggested to me that some yeast strains, like the Irish ale yeast I use for my stout, might carbonate more slowly. Drew says in uh, certain uh, conditions related to sugar slash protein content or pressure in the bottle itself. What I've found is that patience is certainly a virtue, and the longer a beer takes to bottle condition, the smoother and better the beer will be. Well, thanks, Drew. You know, it's similar to advice I give out a lot. Uh, you know, just let the beer condition in the bottle for a while before you give up on it, especially high-gravity beers. Eric from Chandler, Arizona writes, I have a question about doughing in, in all grain brewing. Is it better to add solids, the grain, into liquids, water, or vice versa? I've heard two different sources speak with conviction that each is the way to go. Well, there you go. That's kind of the way it goes. <laughs> uh, Eric says the first source, I don't remember who, said that adding liquid into grain is best because then you don't shock a small amount of grain with a particularly high temperature. On the converse, I heard on the Brewing Network Sunday show that adding grain to liquid result, uh, reduces the chances of forming dough balls. Uh, Eric says, from my experience cooking, I feel like liquid into solid makes more sense. For instance, when making a slurry, you add liquid into solid so that you don't get lumps. Can you offer any help clearing this up? Well, I've always been a grain-to-water kind of guy. Um, I don't think the first grains that fall into the hot water are going to be so hot so long that it will, you know, denature their enzymes. It only takes about 30 seconds or so for me to pour all the grain in, uh, just a bit at a time while stirring with a spoon, but still, it doesn't take very long. Uh, and I don't think that that high temperature on those small amounts of grains in the very beginning is enough to make a difference. Now, I've never tried it, but I would think that pouring water into the grain would have a bigger chance of forming dough balls. And we all want to avoid getting the dough balls. <laughs> Insert your own joke here. So what do you think out there? If you disagree, if you're a water into grain guy and want to disagree with me, please let me know. I certainly don't have a, a monopoly on the brewing truth. So one last thing, Robert from Miamisburg, Ohio writes, what I need to know is if you have ever tried to make any type of apple ale. It's getting close to fall, and I thought it might be a good thing to try. I've looked around the web and I've found a few, but I need to know from an expert what you think is a good recipe. Robert, I, I haven't made an apple ale personally, but it sounds delicious. And I keep, I keep threatening to make, you know, ciders and such. Because uh, Northwest Arkansas used to be the apple capital of the country way back when. And there still are some apple orchards around here. So if you have a recipe for an ale made with apples or apple cider that you love, please share. And uh, if we get a bunch of them, I can make a PDF or something and uh, post a link to it on the site. Giving you full credit, full credit of course, if you send in a uh, recipe. You can write me at uh, james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And if you use the contact form, please check your email address. Now, in the latest issue of uh, Brew Your Own magazine, Chris Colby wrote an article featuring 10 recipes for beers that make the most of your hops. 
Uh, in the article, there is also advice on how to get the most hop flavor from those precious hops that you've managed to track down and secure. And one of those techniques that Chris talks about especially sparked my imagination. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hello, James. Well, we're, we're still talking about hops. It's still a relevant situation because uh, even though I have been able to find good hops, you know, it's not it's not as dependable as it used to be. Oh, that's for sure. Yes. So you, you've got an article called, in the latest uh, BYO, um, Low Hop Homebrewing, uh, and you've got uh, 10 recipes for flavorful homebrew brewed with small amounts of hops. So it's a very relevant article. But the thing that, that got me the most was the sidebar called Getting More from Your Hops. And there was one recipe especially uh, that I want to concentrate on that uses one of these techniques. So let's let's go through the, the kind of list here of, of what you – uh, suggest for getting the most out of the hops that you can actually find. Where do you start? Well, there's, you know, there, there's always been ways to sort of stretch your hop, uh, you know, your hop bill or whatever. And the the most standard one is, is to just boil your hops longer. And you know, one thing you can do is you can move that back to 75 or 90 minutes. You know, your hop utilization will go up, and so you, meet, you use a little less hops. Um, of course, you know, at a homebrew scale. You're not really getting too much, you know. You can, you know, go into your little uh, homebrew calculator and figure it out, but you're not, you know, you're not halving the amount of hops or anything. It's, you know, you're shaving off like maybe a tenth or twenty percent or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, just adjusting, uh, you know, how long you boil your hops is is one way to get more at least bitterness out of them. Um, another way you can do is, or another thing you can do. Is just make sure that you you accentuate the hops that you do use. Um, one thing uh, you know that, that's well known in in cooking and and uh, you know just human physiology of taste and, and smell and stuff is that uh, you, the aroma of what you're you know drinking or t- or eating greatly influences what you taste. And so you know if you're brewing a beer and you're adding you know a sizable amount of bittering hops. You know, make sure you get enough late edition hops in there for flavor and aroma to sort of call attention to those. Mm. Um, so I guess in that case, you're not really saving hops because you're adding more, but you're at least uh, not letting the hops you use, uh, you know, uh, go to waste or be unnoticed. And um, one sort of way you can do this, though, is if you're like uh, me or a lot of home brewers, you know, you, you've been brewing for a while, you've you've bought a variety of hops over the years, and probably stuffed in the back of your freezer, you've probably got some hops from, you know, way back when. Um, over time, hops will lose their, uh, you know, their alpha acids. Those will decline steadily over time. But if they've been stored in a in a freezer that's been, that stays frozen, you know, not, not a frost-free version, but a, a freezer that stays frozen, you know, their flavor and aroma can be, uh, you know, preserved quite well. You know, in fact, there are, there are places that purposely age their hops before they use them, uh, breweries that do that. Um, so, you know, if you're brewing, uh, you know, some hoppy beers, dig back to the back of your, your fridge, you know, pull out whatever your hops you've got, you know, that that are maybe old enough that, you, you know, you wouldn't want to use them for bittering, but just give them a smell. And, uh, you know, if they don't smell cheesy, if they still look green, you know, if they, if they smell, you know, like – Nice fresh hops. Use them, you know, to bump up your uh, your aroma addition or your flavor addition or something, and just, uh, you know, you can accentuate your bittering hops that way. Now, is there a disadvantage to to boiling hops for longer than sixty minutes? I mean, as you as you get toward the like ninety minute mark, are there some some harshness that that you could be pulling out of those two? Well, I don't know. You you read that every once in a while, I, and in fact, I think I mentioned it in the article. Although I say like it may, <laughs> so <laughs> so like regardless of if it does or not, the sentence is correct. Uh, may cause so, internal bleeding. <laughs> may, may not cause internal bleeding. Yeah, that's one of the infinite number of little things in brewing that you know somebody has said at one point, and uh, you know some people believe, some people don't believe, and. I don't know. I think um, I don't know. I've, I've brewed a few beers where I've, I've had you know 
boiled them for 90 minutes, and, and I didn't really see much of a difference. And there, there are a lot of German lagers that boil theirs for, like, 90 minutes, and they're shooting for a pretty, uh, you know, uh, non-aggressive hop character. So I don't know. If I was if I was brewing big batches of beer, you know, which for a home brewer would be 50 or 20 gallons, I probably wouldn't worry about it. I'd, I'd dial the hops back and, and just save, you know, the, the ounce or whatever. You also say that uh, uh, adjusting the, the water chemistry can also accentuate the hops that you've got. Right. Um, most people, most brewers know that uh, adding a little bit of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, the sulfates in the water bring out uh, bring out the hop character. So you, uh, you know, if you're brewing anything that, that's, that's supposed to have, you know, like uh, a hop forward presentation, you know, it's supposed to smell and, and taste like hops. Uh, you know, making sure that you have some sulfates in your water by adding gypsum is a good idea. Um, really, you sort of want to get over maybe up to up to or just over about 150 parts per million gypsum, uh, or, or or sort of the sulfates from the gypsum. And you know, above that, there's there's really not too much of a there's not really a benefit to keep adding it like you can't say well i'm gonna double the amount of gypsum over you know the base recommendation and get twice as hoppy a beer you don't know that doesn't work uh you just end up with like a chalky beer um (laughs) and you've got to you got to know your water chemistry before you start playing with it you got to kind of get a picture of what your water chemistry is before you start throwing stuff in there you may have just the right amount yeah check your local water report and also um I mean, just taste your beers. If you, you know, if you're used to brewing recipes that are, are supposed to make hoppy beers, and you know they they just come out and and the hops just seem like closed off and and you know not as uh, you know not expressing themselves like you would. Maybe you need more gypsum. On the other hand, if you brew, you know, uh, beers that are maybe supposed to be lightly hoppy, and you think that you know, wow, there's even more hops than I thought here, then you know you're probably you probably got a lot of gypsum in your water or, uh, mm. you know, sulfates in your water and you're doing fine. So yeah, check your water report. And, you know, as with everything in brewing, you know, double check the results with your taste buds and, uh, make adjustments as needed. Now this one's common sense, this tip, but uh, you say, ensure that your hops stay in the brewing stream. You know, when you put your, when you first put your hops into the boil, what they're going to tend to do is just float on top. But after a while, if you keep stirring them into the wort, they'll kind of integrate into the boil and roll around there. And uh, that just seems common sense. But, you know, if you if you don't do it, you don't know. Yeah, um, it's, you know, when you add pellets to the uh, to a brew, yeah, they, they come to the top and they're, they're a layer at first. And that's fine to just leave them there. But once they start getting into the boil, you know, you'll have, you know, especially in a heavily hopped beer, you'll have like a ring of, you know, sort of green debris right at the liquid level. And, yeah, you want to knock that, you know, take your brewing spoon and knock that all down in there because they're not, you know, if if the, uh, you know, alpha acids in the hops are, are stuck to the side of your kettle and aren't in your wort, uh, yeah, they're not doing you any good. So knock all that stuff back in, down into your kettle. One place or another place that people maybe don't think about so much is um, the potential for the loss of IBUs during fermentation. Uh, when you ferment, uh, your croissant uh, absorbs a lot of the bitterness. And uh, if you let the, uh, the croissant rise and then fall into your beer, uh, you'll retain a lot of that bitterness. Although, um, you know, some obviously gets contained in the trube and the stuff that sediments to the bottom. Uh you know, so uh, if you're looking to brew, you know, like a, a, a big IPA with a big, you know, bold bitterness, you, you don't want to do that with a blow-off tube so that you're, you know, you're putting your, uh, you know, expensive hops in the uh, in in uh, the kettle, but then having, you know, all the bitterness, or not all of it, but, you know, large amounts of it blow off uh, in fermentation. Um, and there's, this is another thing where there's, you know, differences in, brewing, uh, opinion. Uh, there's some people who, uh, or some breweries that, that skim the Croissant purposely because they say that the, uh, you know, the bitterness that's, uh, sort of entrained in the Croissant is more, uh, is more harsh in character 
than than regular bitterness. You know, you, you sort of read read about that in, in German lager brewing. And you know, it's sort of hard to know if, if that's true or if just skimming that off just makes the beer less bitter and then when you know, of course when things are less bitter they seem less harshly bitter. Um, but you know, most you know, most beer brewed these days commercially is in the big unit tanks and you know, a commercial brewer isn't going to want to deal with, you know, blowing off stuff out, out of his tank. You know, they want to keep the brewery nice and clean, and they don't want to waste ingredients. And, and so, you know, those are those are scaled so that, you know, the fermentation occurs and the, uh, you know, the croissant rises and falls back into the beer. Uh, and, you know, although any anything that's stuck to the side, you're going to lose. But, you know, at that that's sort of inevitable and also... Not you know you're not losing a ton of IBUs that way. Yeah, I've I've seen some pictures in commercial breweries who do use blow off tubes, and and some of these pictures are just like uh, you know huge amounts of croissant coming out of uh, out of the blow off tube, and then that that's always kind of struck me as strange that in a commercial operation it seems like it seems like they would scale their production so that it doesn't do that, but I don't know. Yeah, most most. Most breweries try to avoid it because that's just a big mess they have to clean up. And, you know, especially with Croizen, that's something that, you know, not once it's exposed to air and all that, it's just a prime source for, uh, you know, contaminating bacteria and, mm-hmm. and yeast to grow up on. So you just don't sort of want that in your in your brewery. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know the, the practices of every commercial brewery in the world, but I mean, I was talking with Ashton, and um, you know about this article, in fact, and he was and he was saying, you know, yeah, most breweries try to keep it, you know, keep everything contained within their fermenter. And that's Ashton Lewis, Mister yeah, Wizard. Ashton, Mister Wizard. <laughs> now you also say that, uh, and I I've never thought about this, but your pitching rate can also affect uh, the the bitterness of your final beer. Yeah, uh, yeast uh, take in uh, bittering compounds, alpha acids, and, and probably other, probably beta acids too. Um, although I don't know that for sure. Uh, but you know, they definitely. If you were to, you know, if you were to take uh, the yeast from the end of your fermentation, like make bread with it, you know, you would the bread would be distinctly bitter, and that's because the yeast absorbs some bitterness. And uh, so you, if when you're brewing, uh, you know, especially a very hoppy beer. You don't want to just have the yeast, you know, hoovering up extra bitterness. Uh, so keep your pitching rate, you know, you, you need enough to run a good fermentation because, you know, uh, in order to accentuate bitterness, you certainly want the beer as dry as possible, you know, given given what the style is supposed to be or what you're shooting for. But, you know, you certainly don't want a fermentation that, that, that stalls early and leaves you with an overly sweet beer. But conversely, you don't want to pitch so much yeast that they – just sort of scrub bitterness uh, from your wort. Mm-hmm. So when you're making a, uh, you know, a homebrew version, uh, you know, go look at those, uh, you know, for example, Jamil's uh, pitching rate calculator and or just, you know, look at your notes and figure out, well, how much yeast do I need? And maybe even, you know, from optimal, uh, you can you can cut that down a bit. Like if you... Uh, um, I know, for example, Sierra Nevada, if you would, their pitching rate, if you would do it on a homebrew calculator and then sort of scale it down, they're a little bit below that. Mm. Um, you know, they uh, they pitch enough, obviously, and, and the strain they use is obviously very good. Uh, and, you know, um, that they, they get a good uh, solid fermentation out of it, but they don't pitch enough so that they're, uh, I mean, and, and I don't know if, I don't know if that, specifically was a part of their reason in, in doing it. It was probably just mostly for the characteristics they got from the yeast. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they pitch a little under that. And um, I was actually reading uh, Vinny Chalurzo from uh, Russian River had put out a little pamphlet on, you know, so you want to brew a hoppy beer. And uh, one of his one of his things that he mentioned um, was, you know, don't overdo it on the, hop, on the pitching rate. Huh. Now there there are a couple of um, newer methods that you call them that you mentioned as well, and I want to take the the last one first because I want to spend a lot of time on on the first one. 
But uh, the the last one that you that you mention is actually hopping the priming sugar. Sure. Yeah, someone uh, actually emailed me this one, and uh, I would have mentioned their name in the the thing, except my I've had like three hard drive crashes in the past year, <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, got a good backup system now though. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, he just mentioned, you know, he had done several batches where, you know, prime with, uh, instead of, I mean, you could do it with sugar, but he was doing it with uh, a malt extract, uh, you know, figure out how much malt extract you need, maybe add a little bit more, just because you're going to lose a little bit of the, the work by, you know, straining out the hop solids, but yeah, add some, add some aroma hops, or, you know, some flavoring hops, you know, boil for, you know, 15 minutes or whatever, and add that right to the bottles, and... Um, you know, the, the idea here is that you're adding it to beer where it's, it's fermented and the yeast has already fallen out and you're also putting it, you know, in a closed container. Mm-hmm. So, uh, there's, you know, the little bit of renewed fermentation from the, uh, uh, the priming sugar, but you know, the, the hop volatiles aren't going anywhere, um, you know, cause they're, they're stuck in the bottle. Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, and it's something something that I I plan to do, as well as this uh, this other method, which employs uh, I've used it in in brewing experiments, but uh, other other folks might not have used this in their in their brewing methods. A French press coffee maker, and uh, so so how do you talk us through this? This takes a little bit of of uh, preparation and a little bit of of thinking to kind of, or at least for me to kind of get my mind around. How this works, but uh, but take us through how we can uh, accentuate the flavor of our hops and still get the bitterness out using this technique. Yeah, this is something that um, originally came to me uh, by another BYO reader, a guy named Cameron, gave me a call, and he had done this uh, not so much as a way of saving hops, but just as a way of you know getting a huge blasting hop flavor. And you know what he did was. I uh, took a big uh, French press coffee maker, um, made a little. He made a little water. I, I tried it later with with light wort. And uh, anyway, take take a little, just you know, very low gravity wort. Uh, you know, two or three play doh. You know, like ten oh eight to ten twelve, somewhere in there. Uh, you know, throw your uh, throw your hops in the the French press, um, and these can be. You know, I, I did it with pellets, but uh, you can do it with either. Uh, pellet or uh, whole hops, and then you know pour the boil the wort, pour the boiling wort in there, and let it steep. Um, you know you can let it, depending on what you want to do, you can let it steep for you know he did it for about an hour and then he repeated it. Um, I only did it for about 15 minutes just because I figured that you're going to get you know extraction of the oils happens very quickly and there, there wasn't really a, that much reason to to uh, go any longer. But, you know, this is certainly something that people can experiment with. And anyway, you, uh, at the end of that time, you just press, you know, press down on the French press thing, pour off the liquid, and what you're left with is, you know, you've got that, uh, you've got that, the liquid that's, that's really, really, uh, you know, got a lot of hop aroma to it. And he would take that liquid and add it in secondary, uh, to his beers. And that gave him a huge, uh, you know, hop, hop aroma. And so we'll, what we did when we were thinking about this as a, as a way of, you know, extending your hops was, well, you've got those hops and you've extracted the aroma for them, from them. Uh, if you do that at the beginning of a batch of beer, you can set the, uh, you know, set the aroma extraction aside, you know, scrape the hops out of the French press and use those for bittering. Because, you know, if you, uh, they still have, uh, you know, they're still going to have a lot of alpha acids. And and that, that was actually sort of a secondary reason why I only went 15 minutes is I, you know, I wanted, I knew I was going to be using those hops in the boil, so I didn't necessarily want to go for, um, you know, uh, any extraction of the alpha acids because there's, uh, you know, two steps in, in, in converting, uh, you know, the, the uh, material in the lupian glands to, to bittering, and that's, you know, first they, they alpha acids, uh, you know, get solubilized out of the word, and then they get isomerized. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to, 
you know, I wanted to just extract the oils quickly and then sort of try to leave as much of the alpha acids behind as possible. So, yeah, just basically the idea is is take your uh, take your bittering hops, extract the uh, extract the aroma from them, and set that aside. You know, and then go ahead with your normal beer, brew the you know brew the uh, with the with your kettle addition, and then at the end, uh, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes or to uh, you know the last couple, uh, dump that aroma addition back in and, and save it. Yeah, especially if you're using, uh, you know, Columbus, uh, Tomahawk, or Zeus, you know, that, that strain that goes by three different names. Uh, you know, those are high alpha hops. They're they're very, you know, or, or at least relatively popular as use of bittering hops. And they've got a lot of oil in them. They're some of the oiliest hops around. Um, rather than blowing all that off in the uh, the boil, you know, save some of it and uh, or, you know, close to all of it. I don't, I don't know what percentage you can get with this method. But, um, you know, certainly you, you can dramatically increase the, uh, uh, aroma of your beer if you just don't, you know, throw away the, the, uh, you know, uh, the volatile oils. Mm -hmm. Now here's, now now here's a, here's a question. You, you steep it in the, the French, French press for 15 minutes, squeeze them out. Uh, pour that liquid into another container because you have to, to to get to the hops. Would it would it be beneficial at that point to cool that liquid down so that you don't uh, do any so that you don't volatilize any more of those oils, or am I just thinking too much? You know that's a good question. Um, all I did was I just had a clean bowl and I just set it aside and put a uh, you know some uh, aluminum foil over it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, maybe cooling it down would be a good thing. You know, on the other hand, you're you're adding it back to your boil at the end, so it's going to get. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you were, yeah, if you were really looking to, you know, go, uh, I guess the uh, the hop bettering equivalent of hyper miling, <laughs> <laughs> hyper hopping, uh, maybe maybe you would have run it through a little chiller and and. Uh, Cool it way down. Yeah, but, I hadn't thought of that. That's like that's an interesting idea. Because when you when you think about cooling your wort, uh, you know you you talk about the different hop utilization and, and volatilization during that you know during the summer versus the winter. Because in the winter time you can cool your beer down a lot quicker, so that those hops that you add the last five minutes of the boil are are not going to be at boiling temperature as long. So. I don't know. Right. But that's just me being anal. So <laughs> just no, another good, step to do. <laughs> that that's something I, I hadn't uh really even thought about. I mean I know that if you if you extract it and just let it sit in, in a in a bowl there or, you know, in a I guess you could use a mason jar or something. Uh it's it's still nice and, you know, hop aroma y at the end of your boil because it's just been sitting there. It hasn't been, you know, it's just, you know been gently cooling, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, idea. Maybe uh, so put so put the glass bowl on top of a uh, another glass bowl full of ice water or something. Maybe to yeah. turn it down a little bit. You could maybe even, and this just just got me thinking. You could maybe even instead of pouring pouring boiling wort in there, maybe you can extract the aromas at a lower temperature. Mm-hmm. And like I don't, you know, I'm making this up, but like 160 or something, right. and then. Uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting, hmm. and some, something to try for another day. <laughs> something for the listeners to try and get give yeah. input on, listeners and readers. Um, so, so you you put this practice into designing a recipe, and help me with the name. Is it Tokai's Brutal Pale Ale? Uh, I call it Toki's Brutal Pale Ale. Yeah, there's a there's a cartoon on uh, the Adult Swim on the uh, Cartoon Network called. Uh, Metalocalypse, and the, one of the it's a it's a cartoon about a, a death metal band, and, and the one of the guitar players is named Toki, <laughs> and uh, he's kind of funny. You have to you have to see the show. To, they're always going on about given that they're a death metal band, they always want everything to be brutal. So <laughs> sort of, and they actually they uh, there's a the band that does all the recording uh, for the. Uh, the cartoon actually went on tour, and they were in Austin recently. My wife and I saw them, and it was uh, it was very fun. Was, so, it, was it metal? 
Oh yeah, it was uh, it was really interesting because you know it's Austin, which is a weird town to start off with, and it's a you know a cartoon death metal band playing, <laughs> and but there was two or three like real death metal bands opening it up, so there was you know standing in line outside, there were people with you know Dimu Burger shirts and uh, you know which is another death metal band, and uh, you know all sorts of uh, you know. Uh, you know, Children of Bodom shirts and, and all these, you know, Scando death metal bands. And there were also people dressed as cartoon characters, both from the show and just as other <laughs> random cartoon characters. And, you know, it's just an obvious sort of culture clash. And it's funny just to see these people talking to each other, you know, like, you know, the guys dressed up in all, all black and with, you know, the leather studs and, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 talking to someone dressed up as like Pikachu or something, you know. <laughs> Well, I met the uh, drummer from Pantera down there in Austin one time. I didn't know who he was, but my friend who's a drummer knew who he was. And so, uh, anyway, we digress. That's but not- we digress. <laughs> <laughs> so walk us through this recipe. Uh, you know, how do we make it and how do we employ this uh, this new hopping technique? Okay, yeah, this is just, it's it's basically a straight up pale ale recipe, but with the idea that you know, we're going to work the hops as hard as we can. You know, we're going to get as much out of it as we can. So it's, uh, the recipe is, is you know, it's it's mostly pale malt, uh, a little bit of Munich, just because, you know, a little bit of Munich never hurts, uh, some crystal, and then uh, there is a pound of cane sugar in there just to uh, dry it out a little bit. Mm. Uh, you know, a little bit drier beer accentuates the hops, and, you know, this is at about 10%, so it's not a, you know, doesn't doesn't dry it completely out and leave it without anybody, but it you know uh, it's it's a beer that's you know ten fifty uh, is the original gravity, and you know about about ten percent of that is is from sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, so nice dry beer. Uh, then um, you know the brewing is pretty straightforward of it, uh, except for the. Um, there, there's two separate hop additions that, that you do some, you know, uh, sort of manipulation of. And the first is, is your bittering hop addition where you do uh, the thing with the French press. Um, the recipe calls for, uh, you know, Columbus hops or, you know, if you can't get that, any any high alpha will work. Um, and especially if you get one that's both high alpha and, and you know, fairly oily, that, that's a benefit. Um, but, you know, you, you boil some wort, a, a very, you know, a very small amount, um, oh, actually, I think, let me look at the recipe. I think it calls for a simplification. Yeah, okay. And in, in this case, yeah, you, you get your wort ready. You start boiling it, and then you just scoop a little bit out. You know, put your, uh, put your bittering hops in the French press. Pour the, uh, you know, the, some of the boiling wort into the French press. Uh, let that steep for a little while. Press it off and save the aroma. Um, then scrape the, you know, scrape the hops out of the, uh, uh, out of the French press and boil them for, uh, I think it's a 75 minute. Yeah. 75 mm-hmm. minutes. So you get, you know, a little bit longer boil than normal. Um, get as much as you can out of there. Uh, so that's basically during the boil. There's no, uh, late addition or aroma hops at, you know, at this stage, uh, with the idea that, you know, you're going to go through fermentation. Some of that's going to get scrubbed, um, both by the yeast and also just, you know, as fermentation proceeds, uh, uh, the you know the CO two bubbling up through the uh, the wort you know picks up aromas and 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 you know expels them. That's why you know if you go down and smell your uh, your fermentation lock, it smells good. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know we we don't put anything so it's late in the boil or uh, you know right at the end of the boil. So you're literally using your bittering hops as your flavoring and aroma hops as well. At this point. Yeah, the bittering the bittering hops are used. Uh, yeah, they bitter, and then we, we've extracted the uh, the aroma, and that and that goes in the end of the boil. Uh, although there's no other uh, hop addition at that point. And then in secondary, there's there's where we add the uh, flavoring and aroma hops. And what we do here is, is kind of a convoluted twist on on the previous thing is that uh, this time boil a little bit of malt extract, make a low gravity work. Uh, you know, put the put the hops in the, the French press, put the boiling wort in there, let it steep, press the hops off, uh, you know, and pour out the aroma. 
But then we also go the extra step of scrape those hops out of the thing, boil them for 15 minutes so you at least get some flavor out of them, then combine that, you know, the, the thing you've just boiled 15 minutes with the aroma you've extracted and add that back to the, back to the beer in secondary. Huh. So the uh, part part of the recipe is that when you're done with uh, done with your first brew day, you shoot to you you for a five gallon recipe, you end up with about four and a half gallons of wort, and then in the stage for secondary, you use you know another two quarts to bring that up to the five gallons in the end, and so you add you know you add a little bit of flavor and aroma and, and a tiny bit of bitterness in secondary uh, after most of the yeast has fallen out and after you know. Uh, most of the fermentation has has slowed, so uh, this will stir up a little bit of a of, uh, you know secondary fermentation, but it'll be fairly light. And uh, when you're done, you know you end up with the the recipe calls for just two ounces of hops, which isn't really very much. You know, one of the ounces is is of a high alpha, you know, Columbus or whatever. Mm-hmm. So this beer comes out well. I mean, this this beer has for the small amount of hops, it has a lot of flavor and aroma. Yeah, you. Uh, it comes out, um, you know, as hoppy as a normal pale ale, and we, you know, in the IBU section of the recipe, we clock it at about fifty. Um, you know, if you're using Columbus, you can probably get there. But how you, you know, how you manage each of the steps is gonna is gonna affect it a little bit. And um, you know, if you take uh, instructions for this recipe and and the other advice from the uh, from the article, like you know, uh, making uh, making sure your brewing liquor has enough gypsum or whatever, y- you can make a really nice pale ale uh, with a lot more hop character than you would expect from two ounces of hops. Huh. And I mean, y- you pay for it in that you're you know going through those extra steps with the French press, but you know, at least the the boil day one that's not at all hard to do. Um, uh, you know, the second day one is a little bit of you know you're spending half hour, 45 minutes, getting all that stuff done, uh, you know, on, in addition to what you usually do when you rack to secondary. But, you know, but, it's not, not but brain it, surgery. Yeah, and at this point, in some cases, uh, the hops are more precious than my time. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, I can get more hands on my time, but uh, I can't necessarily get uh, my hands on more choice hops. Now, I, I Twittered, um, or I actually read uh, a Twitter uh, talking about this article uh, before I called you, about 30 minutes before I called you, and I put the question out there, hey, I'm going to be talking to Chris about this article. Are there any questions? And you've answered one, which was, will this work with pellets or hops? And you say yes. Yeah. And the second one is, would it extract too many tannins, this uh, French press method? Are you worried about tannins uh, being extracted from these hops? Um, you know, hops are... Forget the percentage, four or five percent tannin or whatever. But there's there's nothing in this method that would extract tannins anything more than you know throwing them in the boil would do. Uh, in uh, brewing, even with a hoppy beer, you're getting most of your tannins come from your grain bill and and your uh, you know uh, basically your sparge length, how, how much wort you collect from that grain. Um, so no, I, you know, I, I wouldn't theoretically expect any problems with tannin extraction here. And I certainly didn't see any, and I didn't hear any from, from the people who have, you know, who originally gave, gave us these ideas. And, and you bring up a good point. Um, if it's a, it's a more gentle process than boiling the hops for 60 or 75 minutes or whatever. So uh, yeah, the treatment they get inside the, inside the hop or inside the French press is is milder than the boil. So, um, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't expect this to to uh, cause any problems with tannin extraction. Well, this is great. Um, I read this article last night, and I I, I was all excited. Uh, I, I think my next beer is going to use this uh, this method, this uh, French press method, because I've got one, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, I want to put it to good use. So this is uh, another thing to play with, another thing to do on the brew day, uh, and I can't wait to to try it out with my own homegrown hops to try to get the most out of them as well. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. And um, uh, when, when I talked with uh, the guy who 
who started doing the French press method, he claimed that he got about, you know, he pegged it at roughly three times the, the impact of the late edition hops when you added them in secondary compared to, you know, in the boil. Uh. And, and uh, that really sort of rung a bell with me because a couple years ago, uh, I was brewing a, a pale ale, and uh, for some reason I was experimenting with like croisoning, or, or I guess this was an ale, so it would technically be called croisoning. But you know, adding a small amount of fermenting beer at the, you know, um, when fermentation is of your primary batch is done, and I made a batch, and I had this this new variety of hops. That, that I had, had gotten my hand on, Nelson Savin, and I added some of them to the uh, to the little Croisin beer, which is I made about two uh, two quarts and added that to a five gallon batch. And uh, the hop flavor and, and aroma in that batch was just intense. Ah. And it was also really, I remember, and this you know this was slightly different than the uh, a slightly different method than the. Uh, French press method, but uh, it shared a lot of the things. It was being added in secondary. The, you know, uh, the, the you know the fermentation vigor was you know once I added the the fermenting beer to the this main batch was lower, and I also remember it being a very like uh, I want to say like a raw hop presentation, like you know huh. uh, very sort of you know in a in a good way, you know um, in your face. Uh, hop aroma, and uh, I really liked it. And then, you know, trying it this way, I, I got sort of the same, uh, very much the same uh, sort of presentation. Huh. Yeah, I think people, you know, and especially if you're if you're brewing bigger batches of homebrew, it starts to make more and more sense because, you know, in this day and age, why waste? You know, if you're brewing, uh, you know, say 15 gallons of beer, why waste? you know, eight ounces of hops when you could use, you know, three or four instead. Well, awesome. Well, we I look forward to hearing the results from people's experiments. And uh, once again, Chris, I, I appreciate your time. It's been fun. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, thanks again to Chris Colby. You can get a free copy of Brew Your Own by clicking on the BYO ad on basicbrewing.com. And if you decide to subscribe, after reading that free issue, you'll be supporting this podcast. And thanks to everybody who's decided to do that over the years. And uh, thanks to everybody who has supported us financially with uh, purchases of DVDs and such. It is your financial support that keeps these podcasts going, the audio and video side. So as a small business owner, I, I thank you very much. If you have uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Uh, You can check out our DVDs. Our low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD uh, is where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash. And you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs in Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we have an innovative nonlinear design that will take you through the process and give you some choices. we got combo deals on our site. Save you a few bucks if you might want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country and around the world who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Remember, we have shirts. We've got different colors of shirts. Uh, now six colors to choose from. Clothing optional under the shirts, by the way. <laughs> As we learn from the first of the show. Uh, Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. Lots of books bought this past week. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are... Are You There, Vodka? It's Me, Chelsea. And HP Lighthon DF800 8-inch high-resolution digital picture frame with remote. Thanks again, everybody. 
And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support there. We also have an associate link to the Apple Store on the site as well. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dotson down in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.